WCW was many things, and a lot of them good, but even their absolute worst content viewed from the safety of 2019 and removed from the moment itself is perversely entertaining. Things like Viagra on a pole and the Doomsday Cage are subjective. What isn't, however, is that WCW was a massive financial sinkhole. Ted Turner, Eric Bischoff and company wasted so much cash they make Vince McMahon's XFL dalliances look like drops in the ocean. One of the many ways they did this was by throwing huge amounts at silly performers and, yeah, looking at some of these names and numbers, it's no wonder they went out of business. Let's dive into them. I'm Andy for What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 totally ridiculous WCW contracts you won't believe. Number 10 Goldberg. Nobody should ever suggest that Goldberg wasn't a top name by 2001. He absolutely was, and he was inarguably the hottest prospect that the company pushed from 97 onwards. A supposed shoe in to join the WWF post WCW, he instead decided to sit at home and collect on his contract. And why wouldn't he? Dollar Bill was earning 2.5 million a year, and that was set to skyrocket up to 3.5 million in his fourth year. Look, I say all this as a guy who absolutely loves Goldberg even today, but that's a mind-blowing amount of money for someone who was, for all intents and purposes, still a relative rookie next to some of WCW's other stars. During this stretch, Goldberg stood to earn a whopping 11 million from his agreement, and that's before taking into account other pay-per-view bonuses. Not even the much maligned Kevin Nash was earning as much as Goldberg here. His core salary was 1.45 million in 99 and 1.625 million from 2000 to 2001. Number 9 Bret Hart WCW never got to see the best of Bret Hart, though his performances almost didn't matter by the time he got there because the hitman was on guaranteed money. Hart's contract was to the tune of $2.5 million. On top of that, he pocketed 8.5 grand per live event and was guaranteed over 125 dates a year. There was also Brett's reimbursement for disability clause, ensuring he'd get a $100,000 payout covering any problems incurred inside the ring, including presumably sprained ankle or a little bruise. And yeah, it sounds like there was some serious thought put into this deal, perhaps more so than anybody not named Hulk Hogan. Breaking down the 125 dates at the eight and a half grand number, that's an extra total of over one million dollars. Keep in mind that that's also the minimum amount, not necessarily the final fee. Now in fairness, Brett didn't wrestle as much as that come 2000 after getting booted in the head by Goldberg one year prior, but still, it's kind of crazy. Number 8. Roddy Piper Piper's last WCW match on the 13th of December 1999 Nitro was against Kurt Hennig. After that, his appearances were sparse. And again, it didn't matter at all. Piper's deal wasn't terminated until July 2000, meaning he sat on the sidelines collecting a huge paycheck effectively for doing nothing. From 1999 onwards, Piper's contract allowed him $750,000 a year. Before he was released, that was supposed to rise to 800 grand in 2001. While he wouldn't get that far, Roddy was able to take advantage of some other contractual perks. If WCW wanted to use Piper for anything, they had to give him 60 days notice before the date. Furthermore, he was only contracted to work a maximum of six pay-per-views and a mere 45 other dates sprinkled throughout the rest of the year. I guess it's good work if you can get it. Number 7. Horace Hogan at least the names mentioned so far in our list were stars who at some point helped contribute to WCW success. Horace Hogan, however, uh, he was not. Instead, he got by on the basis of being Hulk Hogan's real life nephew. WCW, in all their wisdom, decided this was worth at least $225,000 a year. And by 2000, that number rose to 250, meaning he was making more than double what Chris Candido was at 104k and Norman Smiley was at 120k. Despite 
a pretty clear talent gap. Yes, Horace raked in 130 grand more than one of the current respected trainers at WCW's Performance Center in the year 2000. Unsurprisingly, he only wrestled a handful of times after WCW folded. Number 6. Alex Wright There was a time when fresh-faced Alex Wright looked like a prospect that could possibly be turned into a major player with the right booking. By the late 90s, that promise had faded and Alex was turned into the Mohawk Sporting Berlin. That this couldn't get over didn't stop WCW from paying him a cool $395,000 for his last year in the company. Now Wright's original contract weighed in at 375 k Management would agree to a raise in the second year of the one-time Dancing Wonderkind's new deal. When Berlin failed to catch fire, they had no choice but to part with the cash. Keep in mind that Wright's Berlin gimmick didn't debut until May 1999. That means he sat at home for close to a year, earning around 32 grand per month before WCW decided to bring him back. Then, the writers lost faith in his new character and paid him a hefty amount to job out on TV and at house shows. Number 5. Ernest Miller Give it up for Ernest the Cat Miller. Not only was the guy one hell of a dancer who loved himself some James Brown, he was also well versed in the art of Scrooge McDuckin. How else could WCW's decision to greenlight a contract worth $400,000 a year be explained? That wasn't the end of it either. Had WCW stayed in business beyond 2001, Miller's deal called for him to get a 50k raise. As he was never realistically going to become a headliner on a roster still jam-packed with marquee names, that made the cat one of the higher earners on the crammed mid-card. The investment wasn't worth it. Feuds against Jerry Flynn and a gig as a WCW commissioner in 2000 that was played for laughs failed to justify a huge contract at the time when the company was leaking funds. Number 4. Scott Hall Scott Hall didn't do much actual wrestling between 99 and 2000. According to Cage Match, he worked just 32 matches across those two years. Now, here comes the bit you should be used to by now. It didn't matter. Hall still collected his pay and he was one of WCW's highest earners towards the end. Now, in his defense, he was going through a ton of personal problems at the time. It was cool of WCW to stick by him, and it's obviously great that he's in a much better place these days than he was back then. Even so, his raise from 1.45 million to 1.625 million in 2000 seems a bit daft, considering how little he actually worked. Hall's contract had a maximum number of 180 days written in. As he worked just 26 matches in 1999, he was barely screwed scraping 15% of that figure, and it was made worse in 2000. Hall wrestled a mere 6 matches that whole year, and that's 3% of his deal, if you're counting. Number 3. Jeff Farmer Old crusters like me should remember WCW trying to fool fans into thinking that Sting had joined the NWO by painting Jeff Farmer up from 96 onwards. Obviously, it was a ruse, although Sting would become an NWO Wolfpack member a bit later on. In total, wearing the makeup, Farmer made just one appearance under the guise from 98 onwards. Despite this, he signed a new contract in June 99 worth $150 per annum, and yet he didn't wrestle that whole year. He did, however, log just under 100 matches for New Japan, so maybe WCW had brokered a deal there. Whatever, the 150k is on their contract database and not NJPW's. In effect, Farmer was paid 150 grand between 99 and 2000 to not play the NWO Sting character. He wasn't released until the summer of 2000, and he only wrestled one more time before bouncing. Number 2. Ralphus Looking back on it, Ralphus was premium WCW banter. Though the idea of this fella getting an actual contract with the company is just so damn bizarre and a glaring, glaring example of just how stupid these guys were with their money. With an annual salary of $78,000, here is a brief list of wrestlers that are on less money than Ald Ralphie. Crowbar, 75k. Sean O'Hare and Mark Jindrak, a paltry 31.2k each. Johnny the Bull, 75k. Stacey Keebler, 
15k, Shannon Moore, 75k, Daphne, 52k, and The Wall, brother, 75k to stand on that ridiculous hotel and point at Hulk Hogan. On top of that sweet amount, Ralph has also bagged himself a $750 appearance fee and a guarantee that he'd get at least two working days per week from WCW. In other words, the bumbling dude who had his ass crack showing during Norman Smiley's hardcore matches earned a further one and a half grand every week just for making towns. And in 2000, Ralph has raked in close to 80k for doing next to nothing. Good! Number 1. Tank Abbott there's one name and one name alone that outlines everything wrong with WCW in 2000. Ex-UFC badass Tank Abbott was someone that Vince Russo had high hopes for when the fighter traded mixed martial arts for pro wrestling in 99. Which on the surface level is absolutely fine, because Abbott had a legitimate reputation and he gained significant popularity in the UFC. But giving him a contract worth $850,000 a year, that's not so fine. WCW proceeded to do precisely nothing but book Tank in silly gimmick matches, and the one he had against fellow MMA turned wrestling flop Jerry Flynn at Sold Out 2000 summed it up nicely. Fans, rightly, didn't want to see shoot fights on their wrestling pay-per-views. Things would reach a new low when Tank became a super fan of the phony boy band Free Count, then started a new dancing gimmick. Remember when he wore that tank top with the cutout titty holes at New Blood Rising? 850k, baby! And as preposterous as it sounds, WCW were paying this man almost a million dollars to goof around and ruin his credibility. So that's our list, but what do you guys think and can you recall any other insane WCW contracts that I, myself, have forgotten about? Hit us up in the comment section below, don't forget to like, share and subscribe, then you can follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and myself at AndyHMurray if you're into that kind of thing. Bye!